Hello, this is Eitan Shalom, and I wanted to talk about Keshari Mudra that I talked about in the previous Pranayam video. Um, mudras in are symbols, religious symbols in both Hinduism and Buddhism. They're considered spiritual gestures that can be also part of Bharatanatyam, a uh, South Indian classical uh, dance, which is based on the Hindu religion, actually. And, um, but in yoga, in Hatha yoga, mudras are most often used in conjunction with pranayam or pranayama and also meditation, generally while in a seated posture. And they're said to stimulate different parts of the body involved with breathing and to affect the, affect the flow of prana. Um, they have in tantric yoga, there's all kinds of uh, theories about mudras and uh, involving Bindu and bodhicitta and amrita and all kinds of things involving consciousness. I personally am a bit allergic to the word consciousness because I find it to be a fairly meaningless term when it comes to what real life is about. I mean, because you can talk about consciousness all you want. You still have to be nice to people. You still have to do good in the world. And it's much harder to do that than to talk about consciousness in an abstract philosophical sense. So um, it can become almost a kind of spiritual materialism to uh, quote Trungpa, the Buddhist teacher, Tibetan Buddhist teacher, um, endless talking about speculation about consciousness. Uh, personally, I'm interested in what I can do to try to be a better human being now and also to be happy. So, Keshri Mudra that I was talking about in the previous video. Keshri Mudra is a mudra that in and of itself is associated with all kinds of kundalini yoga and all kinds of spiritual things. And I have seen, um, uh, uh, read uh, um, people uh, claiming uh, very specific uh, neurotransmitter reactions to Keshri Mudra that I don't know what the research is uh, and it doesn't even matter to me, but it, it's somewhat logical. Uh, perhaps uh, knowing how the acupuncture points and the and the uh, work and the the pressure points in Ayurveda, that if you take the um, tongue and press it against the soft palate for an extended period, who knows? Maybe that does increase dopamine levels. Uh, it certainly does feel like it uh, increases endorphins. So, uh, which are associated with feelings of, you know, kind of ecstasy and bliss. Runner's high is endorphins. So again, now that there's good light, natural light, here's how you do Keshri Mudra. I'm going to show you how to do Keshri Mudra again, and then I'm going to show you how to do the Pranayama uh, again that I showed you last time. Uh, so Keshri Mudra, you take your tongue, the tip of your tongue. I'm going to stick my tongue out to show you what I, what I mean. I mean, we all know what the tip of our tongue is, but it's the, almost the lower, it's the lowest part of the tip. It's almost the beneath the tip. So you're going to curl your tongue like that and press it against the soft palate as far back as you can go towards the throat without straining. There's never any strain in yoga or Tai Chi. So curl the tongue back. If you want to experiment, you can just do that without the pranayama and see what that feels like. Um, uh, there's something in yoga called Bija Mantra, where you repeat mantras silently in your head. And I'm going to do another video about mantra. And I always find it very helpful to do Keshri Mudra when I'm doing Bija Mantra because then it focuses my mind and helps me stay concentrated. So, um, you know, when you um, watch the Mahouts press the points on the elephants, 
and see that the elephants respond in predictable ways, it's not so surprising that a fellow mammal like us, who's not that far from the elephant evolutionarily, if you compare uh, us vis to uh, uh, reptiles and amphibians, uh, then um, it's not so surprising that mudras would have an effect. Um, uh, some of the mudras that we do with the hands, this is a mudra. You'll see in Hindu and Buddhist statues, you'll see this mudra, you'll see this mudra, you'll see that mudra. Um, so uh, mudras most often involve the hands. Uh, and um, it's interesting because in acupuncture, the, the points at the tips of the fingers are extremely powerful. And uh, all of the channels involving the emotions end at the end at the fingertips. So now pranayam, uh, what my uh, teacher Yogi Ramaya called Nauli Kriya Pranayam um, involves trying to fill your lungs as deeply as possible without strain, as deeply as possible by recruiting the muscles of your torso in order to have a really full um, diaphragmatic breathing. Um, one way to describe pranayama is diaphragmatic breathing. You're recruiting your diaphragm consciously. When you, the way the, the lungs work, and it's something that goes unconsciously through the autonomic nervous system or the automatic nervous system, you don't think about breathing, you just breathe, which is why when you're, depending on your mood, your breathing can change. If you're furious, if you're terrified, you know, if you're terrified, your heart beats quickly and your breathing gets fast. Um, so in pranayam, we're, we're taking what's unconscious and making it conscious. And we're slowing it down and, and deepening it. So we're increasing the experience of breathing for our benefit. And um, as I said in the last video, in both uh, in Chinese medicine, uh, we describe that our energy comes from food, air, and sleep. And you can live without food for much longer than you can live without breathing. You can live without sleep, but you know, sleep deprivation will make you go insane if it's extended over a long enough period of time. You'll get delusions and, and hallucinations. Um, everybody knows that you feel rested after a good night's sleep. That's why we say that it's not that we create energy through sleep, but we restore our energy. We really get energy from food and water, but a uh, food, water, and air. But when you die, how do you, what does it mean to die? It means that you stop breathing. Then your heart stops pumping, your brain stops working. So um, it's interesting to note when we talk about the breath, why is breath so closely associated with energy? Because the energy that we get from solid food uh, is a very gross material energy. And notice that the linguistic roots of the word spirit and spiritual is also tied to the words for breath, like pneuma in ancient Greek. And this idea of spiritual as which is sort of a, I don't know if it's a, a Christian idea of the spiritual as being transcendent. It's also Hindu, I suppose, as being etheric and transcendent. That's the breath. And in Chinese medicine, we describe the soul. I know I'm going on a tangent, but that's okay. If you're not interested, go to another video. Um, in Chinese medicine, the, the soul is broken down into several parts and the soul of the liver, which is the general, which is everything corporeal, everything physical about us, that soul when we die goes back into the earth. The soul of, and that's called the Han in Chinese, the soul of the lungs, which is called, sorry, my nose itches, the, 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 the um, soul of the lungs, which is called the Po, which is by nature etheric because it involves grasping the chi out of the air and, and, and sending it to the heart so that it can be transformed into, into oxygen, into the blood. Sorry, I have a very itchy nose today. 
um, apologize, that soul um, goes, returns to heaven on death. And we say in English, when someone dies, that he's, she or he has breathed their last breath. So there's something very, uh, as, as, <laughs> sorry, as Trump would say, there's something going on with the breath. That's a joke. Sorry, my nose is very itchy. I apologize. Um, you, one can't plan these things. Good thing I'm not a TV host. Um, so, um, yes, I do have a sense of humor. So, there's something going on with the breath that was observed by the ancient Hindus, the ancient yogis, the ancient Chinese, um, that um, there's the kind of breathing we do can, at a minimum, calm the mind. And that's why pranayama is so useful for people with anxiety. Even we, you know, when a little kid's excited and upset about something and they can't even speak, they want to tell you something, you, what do you do? You tell them, slow down, t Johnny, take a deep breath, take a deep breath, slow down, right? And um, even one of my patients who had an anxiety disorder, she learned from her psychologist a very nice, it's not pranayama, but a breathing technique to short circuit her panic which was to take a really long, deep breath, like diaphragmatic breathing, hold her breath for a count of three, and then blow out forcefully through her mouth as if blowing out birthday candles, like this. Right? So deep breath. Hold it for a count of three. And that immediately releases some of the nervous system tension associated with anxiety. So... Let's go back to Keshri Mudra and Pranayam. So in Yogi Ramaya's Nauli Kriya Pranayam, you're going to consciously bring the breath as deeply as possible into the lungs by re recruiting the muscles of your lowest part of your abdomen. I'm going to, I don't know how good the light is now for you. I'm going to stand up to show you. I think, how do I get good light here? I don't think it's going to work. I'm going to sit down again. You're going to have to... Uh, there we go. That's a little better. So, I know you can't see that well. I'm going to demonstrate. So, I'm going to expand the muscles of the lowest part of my belly, and then the middle part of my belly, the upper part of my belly, the middle part of my torso, exactly where the diaphragm is, between the belly and the chest. We have this sort of interesting differentiation between the belly and the chest, which makes sense because on the spine, the, this is where the thoracic spine ends, and this is where the lumbar spine begins, lo and behold. And people carry a lot of tension exactly at that point, at the thoracolumbar junction. Uh, some people have so much tension there, I cannot even needle them. In fact, you can't even touch them. They jump. Um, and those are generally what we would call liver types in Chinese medicine, people carrying a lot of tension. But anyway, so exactly where the thoracic vertebra end and the lumbar vertebra begin, that is the, the vertebra of the, of the upper back and the vertebra of the lower back, that junction is where the diaphragm is. And people who are anxious and or tense tend not to breathe deeply and fully, lo and behold which means you could be getting more oxygen in your blood if you breathe better, number one. Number two, you'll relax more if you breathe better. And you can learn, if you practice pranayam, this is why you should do this. If you, if you, and this is why you should send me money through PayPal at the end of this video. Kidding. Half kidding. Um, feel free. Um, uh, Eitanshalom1 at gmail.com. Uh, uh, anyway, um, this is why you should do uh, pranayam because it'll train you how to breathe more deeply so that in your daily life, you'll breathe more deeply and you'll have this skill that when you're, you notice yourself carrying tension, let's say you are, you're on a deadline and you're working on the computer, you'll automatically take a deep breath and let it go. That letting go of a deep breath, it's, it, you know, you can't let go of complex psychological problems miraculously just by doing that, but you can let go of the nervous system state that you're currently in. 
by doing what I just did, taking a deep breath and exhaling. Um, one of my Buddhist meditation teachers, uh, Tanisro Bhikkhu Ajahn Jeff, um, when he teaches uh, um, mindfulness meditation, he'll often have people just take a couple of deep breaths and exhale just to kind of let go, and then that enables you to drop in. So I'm going to drink a little bit of water. And as I said yesterday, sorry, as I said yesterday and uh, the last two uh, pranayam videos, that uh, my teacher, Yogiru Maya, uh, advised sipping a little bit of sesame oil. You could also use coconut oil. You could also use ghee. And you could use any kind of vegetable oil if that's all that you had. Just sip a little bit before you begin because it lubricates your throat. Because breathing, uh, doing pranayam and, and uh, breathing uh, abnormally forcefully, there's, it's as if wind is blowing and wind dries things out. You, you hang up your clothes on the line and if it's your wet wash clothes and if it's a windy day, they dry more quickly. So wind is drying. And this is why in Ayurveda, vata types uh, tend towards dryness uh, anywhere in their body. Um, okay, so I'm going to demonstrate. And when you do this Nali Kriya Pranayam, you'll notice that you, you make a rather large sound in your throat because, especially because, sorry, when you do Keshri Mudra and do Pranayam, the sound is louder because when you bring your tongue up to the, to the soft palate, at the roof of your mouth, as far back as you can go, it actually opens up your throat. So here we go. <clears throat> I'm going to oh, keep, you'll, you'll do this with your eyes closed, but I'm going to keep my eyes open only because I want to see if you can see the, the expansion of the belly. It, I might have to move the camera. All right, I'm going to stop there. Um, so a few things. One, if you want to think about what you're doing on the out-breath, on the exhalation, the resha come in, in Sanskrit, the, the, the exhalation, it's almost like you're kind of trying to squeeze a, a, a rag. You're trying to squeeze your lungs to get all of the air out. But what you have to be careful about and, and I do this sometimes, uh, um, is um, going so far that at the point where you start to breathe in again, you're out of breath because you want it to be controlled and relaxed. 
so you don't want any strain and so there's a balance between squeezing every last drop of air out of your lungs on the out breath there's a balance between doing that and going too far so that when you start the in breath you're short of breath and i did that uh, two of my of my five uh, breaths just now i think there were five i, I wasn't counting um and uh so because you want the in breath to be very steady so you don't want to be forcing gasping for oxygen at the beginning of the in breath so the in breath is is steady and the out breath is steady and it's rhythmic it's it's like the waves of the ocean um and so that's how it should be over time you're going to increase your lung capacity guaranteed uh, because when i started doing this when i was 17 um my teacher would measure our lung capacity by seeing how far we could blow out a candle and how far away he, he could keep the candle. Um, and um, so um, this is a very good exercise for people with who get colds all the time or also people with asthma, especially. Um, pranayama is very good and there are some specific additional pranayams that I'll show in another video that are that are specifically good for asthma. But um, so key points to review. One, sit comfortably on your sit bones with your spine straight and your chin tucked in very slightly as you do with meditation. If you're sitting on the floor, if you can sit comfortably on the floor, sit on the floor, but you have to be able to do it comfortably. Um, uh, sit with your legs crossed or in the comfort sugasana, the comfort pose, or you can sit in the half lotus or full lotus if you can do that comfortably. Um, to choose between sitting in a chair and sitting on the floor is simply a matter of if you can sit on the floor comfortably. And if you can sit on the floor comfortably cross-legged, but you need a pillow under your buttocks, under your sit bones, the way uh, some Buddhists do when they meditate, that's fine, then do it seated on the floor. It's definitely better seated on the floor. That's number one. Number two, pranayama is best done out of doors, uh, in fresh air, not by the side of the road, obviously. But if you can choose between sitting indoors and outdoors, you definitely wanna do it outdoors. During the day, under a tree is a fabulous place because leaves secrete oxygen during the day. Um, if you have to do it indoors, uh, you have to open windows, even if it's winter, open windows, you know, get some fresh air in the room. Um, okay. That's number two. Number three, if you can do it with your shirt off, do it with your shirt off, especially if you're outside. It's felt in yoga that you absorb prana through the skin. Prana is the same thing as chi in Chinese medicine. And it's something that includes oxygen in the air, but goes beyond that. So without getting into it, if you would like to do it with your shirt off, that's a good idea. Recommend it in yoga. That's number three. Number four, Keshri Mudra. You're curling your tongue backward. You're pressing your tongue against the soft palate in the back of your throat. Do it as, as far as you can go. And you can even, it's a muscle, your tongue. So and it's a muscle that weakens with age, just like all other muscles. So in any event, um, you can really work on pushing it back, but don't strain uh, while you're doing pranayam. But you can push it back, uh, curl it back, and then you can practice a little bit of kind of forcing it a little bit and over without strain, without strain, without strain, without strain. Over time, you'll actually get better at Keshri Mudra as well. Um, so Keshri Mudra for this pranayam, Nauli Kriya Pranayam. And then um, finally, the method of this basic method of this pranayam, which is what would what's called diaphragmatic breathing when they teach it in hospitals, uh, when they want to use Western terms, and um, involves it's like a bellows. You're you're expanding the your belly so as to pull your diaphragm down, so as to open up the bottom lobes of the lung. The lungs have lower, middle, and upper lobes, by the way. And the way that the lungs work, the lungs by themselves can't do anything in terms of, of taking in air. They have no power to do that. They do that because of the diaphragm. 
Um, and the diaphragm, when you, when, you, when you breathe in, you know, automatic breathing when you're not thinking about it, um, what's happening is your diaphragm, which is this giant horizontal muscle across the, the thorax from the front to the back, the diaphragm, it's more like this, the diaphragm goes down. I, I can't, yeah, there we go. The diaphragm goes down. And when it does that, it pulls the lungs down and then air comes into the lungs and fills the lungs up. And then when you exhale, the diaphragm goes back up and it pushes. So when you're doing this Nali Kriya Pranayam, you're actually trying to get the diaphragm to expand downward more by recruiting the muscles of your, of your belly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you're also trying to get the lungs giving, you're, you're increasing the, uh, the, 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 what's it called? The, the, uh, the, uh, the, the cavity, the pleural cavity that the lungs exist in, you know, if someone sits on your chest, you can't breathe, right? If, if somebody sat on your chest, you'd have trouble breathing. Um, but it's conversely, if you use your muscles of your chest to open up the pleural cavity, you're giving the lungs more space in which to take air in. That's the, um, I don't want to say biology. Well, that's that's the uh, physiology. Thank you. That's the physiology of, of how this works. So um, again, I'm going to do it one more time. I don't think you can see my belly. Let me try that. I don't know if there's enough light. But I'm going to hold it here. Okay, so um, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, that felt better than the first five that I did. Um, and that's how it works. Um, uh, I've noticed that over my life that when I sit down to do my pranayam, I struggle a little bit with the first five breaths. And then as my nervous system comes down and as probably it's just like, you know, when you need some clay, I think uh, things get warmed up. I don't know what's happening, but those five felt much better, more fluid. Um, not, I didn't feel like I was uh, short of breath at the end of the exhalation. So practice makes perfect. Um, I left two things out. One is the what you're going to do with your hands, which is you're going to rest one hand on top of the other. So the palm up, palm up, back of, this is my right hand, back of my right hand on my left palm, or if you're more comfortable, 
you can do it the other way. Um, and um, your thumbs will be just touching very lightly like that. So this is the, the hand mudra for this pranayam. And then you'll rest your, your hands in, in your lap. And also just make sure your shoulders are relaxed. Everything's relaxed. And then the other thing is how many will you do and how often? You'll do this twice per day. If you want to get good at it, you have to practice. And the best way to practice is with regularity and discipline. Um, the ideal time to do the morning pranayam, as you know from the previous video, is between 3 and 6 a.m. It's okay uh, if you're up for it to get up at 3 or 4 a.m., do the pranayam, and even go back to sleep if you, if you need to. Or, you know, in an ideal world, like when I lived in the village in South India, everybody in that village went to bed by 8 p.m., so everybody was up by 4. If you wanted to buy milk at the so-called milk depot, um, you had to be there by five or the milk was all sold out. <laughs> so, and there wasn't much electricity, so there wasn't anything to do in the evening, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there was no television, no internet. There was radio, but the radio was, was finished by the evening. They would go off the air, all India radio. And um, so the best time to do pranayama is in the early morning, the earlier, the better. If you can get up at four or five, do it then. If you have the time, the best thing to do is to do pranayam, do 15 minutes of meditation, and then do some yoga asanas or postures and start your day like that, and then do whatever you're, you're gonna do after. Obviously you get up and you brush your, wash your face and brush your teeth first, go to the bathroom. Um, and then you're gonna do 16. And how will you count? How will you keep track of, of doing 16? Is using your fingers. So you're like this, and then one, two, see I'm lifting my index finger up, three, middle finger, ring finger, pinky, like that. And then you can do the other fingers on the other hand. That's one way to keep track. Um, and then You'll want to do it twice a day, and the second time of day, which is the best time to do it, is in the evening before dinner. Why? Because you may, um, you won't forget to do it. If you're committed to doing it before dinner, you're always going to eat dinner, and this will make this will ensure that you do it. So, before dinner, do your pranayam, meditate for 15 minutes. You'll have a very relaxing evening. If you, if you wait to do it after dinner, then you have to wait a couple of hours to digest because you never do pranayam right after eating. And then you're liable to fall asleep, get tired, whatever it is. The other thing that's really valuable is to set aside one place in your home. If you're lucky enough to have enough room, you could even make a meditation room. If you can't make a meditation, pranayam and meditation room where there's window and fresh air, if you can't do that, then set up a, an area, like a shrine area of your living room or whatever it is. And if you live in an apartment, it can even just be one small space where that's where you sit to do your pranayam and meditation and you do your, your yoga postures over there as well. And that's simply using classical conditioning. You'll look at that spot and it'll remind you. And not only that, as soon as you sit down in that spot, you're going to start to feel like doing meditation and pranayam. You'll feel that, as we would say in the U.S., you'll feel the vibe. And in yoga, they actually call that the shakti or energy of the sadhana. Um, in yoga, uh, pranayam, meditation, asanas, mantras, uh, 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 bhakti practices, devotional practices, these are all called sadhana. Sadhana are yoga practices, and it's understood that when you do a lot of sadhana, it gives you a lot of energy. And that word that they use for energy is called shakti. Um, and so um, pranayam, uh, doing it in the same place, doing your pranayam and meditation in the same place every time, that space has a feeling of shakti. And that's exactly why um, when you go to a place like India or 